Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Rangers Review Morning Briefing for Tuesday, the 16th of April. I'm Derek Clark, and I'm joined uh, by, first of all, Joshua Barry. How are you doing, Joshua? Good, yeah. Back down the A9 safely there, so all good, and uh, looking forward to talking over what was not a very good Rangers performance before we uh, start to look forward to finally Rangers versus Dundee being played. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, Stevie also joins us. I uh, bet that journey down from Dingwall was a long one, Stevie. Yeah, it certainly was. Nothing like a eight-hour round trip to Sober Yacht, is there? So, yeah, not a, not an enjoyable experience. Absolutely not. Uh, I'll get your views on the game shortly. Uh, just a quick word for our podcast sponsors. As ever, MPH Boilers have got some cracking Viesman Boilers on offer at this moment in time. You get that free internet controller. Flexible finance options are available. They've got the first year services service free as well. Um, the all important links are in the description below. Uh, and you'll also notice that we've got a, a new deal on the website, I'll fire up the little image here, uh, as if by magic. There we go. We've got a spring sale on the website just now, folks. You can uh, take out an entire year's subscription for just £18. Not only that, you get entered into a draw for a signed Rangers jersey, that classic uh, Gaza jersey from the 94-95 uh, uh, season. Well, the 94-95, that was uh, Loudrop's season, I'm sure. Uh, Gaza was a season after that, but uh, yet yeah, signed by both Gaza and McCoy. Joshua, am I right yeah. in thinking? That's right, yeah. And you get all current subscribers are, of course, included in this, Derek, as well, because we like to look after our current subscribers. You can subscribe, it's an, a year for £18, or um, if you want to do a shorter and, and just test out what the content on the website is like. Um, for six months, it's just one pound for six months. Um, links are in the description. If you want to subscribe, if you've already subscribed to the website, you'll be entered into the draw or you will get a, um, a, a form sent out to you um, if you're a subscriber, so that will come automatically. But if you want to be involved with that, subscribe by the 29th of April, one pound for six months or 18 pound for a year. And uh, yeah, get all the content and be in with winning a fantastic prize. Yeah, uh, one of my favourite jerseys, that one, uh, that Rangers jersey. And uh, yeah, get a, a subscription to the website as well, folks. Head over to rangersreview.co.uk forward slash subscribe to sign up. Um, right, I'm keen to get your thoughts. You both were at the uh, Ross County game on Sunday. Steve, I'll get your view first of all. Uh, now, me and Chris pretty much tore the team apart yesterday, but uh, I'm keen to get your thoughts. Uh, as the title bid derailed? Yeah, and it's blown it big time. I think it's certainly derailed. Whether it's over or not, we'll find out pretty soon, Derek. But um, it's a disgraceful performance, both individually and collectively. Joshua will be able to dissect it much more analytically than I can. But what I saw with my eyes, we were completely torn apart by a Ross County team that's second bottom of the league. Mm. Created four or five clear opportunities in the first half. Didn't heed that warning. Didn't change it at half time. Didn't fix it. Too many players aren't good enough for for Rangers standard. And then when the core group who have been raising them up in recent months hit the kind of wall which they have recently, then the whole thing falls apart. And I think that's where we are individually and collectively. The performance levels are miles away from good enough. And we've seen four points in, in 12, four points from 12, you know, it's, it's just not good enough. I think we didn't realise it at the time, but um, Oscar Cortez's injury is absolutely massive. It's completely thrown the whole side. And then injuries to, to Red Van Yomas. I think the defence is, is currently an absolute mess. The midfield, which we spoke about, Derek, if you remember, I, I said to you last week about this, yep. that I had real issues with the midfield. Midfield is a complete mess as well. And up front is up front. You know, it will take us three, four chances to take goals and that, that will cost us, which it has. So, you know, I don't really, I don't really think there's there's too much more that you can say. There's certain individuals, Derek, that will continually let you down, and I think the problem is when they perform so highly throughout the season, then when they do dip, there's nobody else to help them out. And I'm talking about Tavernier, I'm talking about Goldson, I'm talking about John Lundstrom, because they probably, sadly, are our best players. But the issue is that when they fall apart, there's nobody else that will bail in and and kind of put, help them out. So James Tavernier, when he has a bad game. You know, we're still looking at James Tavernier to try and bail us out. But the individual performance says on, on Sunday, Derek was awful. Positionally, on the ball, off the ball, 
the amount of transitions that Ross County got that we didn't pick up. And listen, I'm not meaning to be disrespectful. They're a team that's second bottom of the league and you're getting ripped apart by guys like Josh Sims. You know, um, Simon Murray has made a career out of terrorising our defence. And it and he's no disrespect to Simon Murray. He was playing at Queen's Park and stuff a couple of years ago. You know what I mean? And, and we should be a lot better than that. And we're not. And there's big questions there, you know. Um, and I can't help but go back to conversations we've had in, in years gone by that the same big players will continually let you down when it comes to the crunch, Derek. And if we're really serious about talking about this, it's the same ones all the time. And I think that's why people are fed up because criticisms now went way over the top and it's went completely the other way because people are, are consistently fed up at the same points of the same seasons, the same players, the same actors doing the same things. And in recent weeks, you know, if we're going to call it properly, John Lundstrom, James Tavernier, Connor Goldson have fallen miles away. Borna Barisic comes in and looks like he's completely lost and given up on the left-hand side yeah, as well. Yeah. So, yeah. They are what you would consider your core group. And this is what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to be balanced and say that these guys have consistently throughout the season performed well and perhaps lifted the rest of the team. But see, when they dip, the quality isn't there throughout the rest of the squad and throughout the rest of the team. And I've got problems with the teams that, that come on to selecting. I don't think he's getting it right. It seems to me like he's throwing stuff at a wall, hoping things will stick. And the amount of early subs and things we're having to make is really concerning for me. But it's whether or not he has the foresight, I think, or the, quite frankly, the balls to make the really big decisions. We're going to find out because he's got real issues, real issues in the centre of defence. He's got real issues in midfield. Is he prepared to fix it? We're going to find out. But I thought they were disgraceful on Sunday, collectively, individually, everything. And I thought they were miles away. And as I said... I know that Joshua touched upon it yesterday. I read his piece where he's talking about XG for Ross County. Ross County had four clear chances in that first half, including the first minute in the back post. Mm -hmm. And then they scored three in the second. Derek, we could have been looking at four or five at the weekend and it wouldn't have been a surprise. It shouldn't have been. That's how bad it was. Um, and if they don't wake up, then they'll, they'll end this season not only with no more trophies, but with a few more defeats like that. And that's unfortunately the situation we're in. We're not fighting yep. not only for a title, but we're fighting to make sure this season doesn't completely derail. Yep. Uh, just on Simon Murray, if he was in the Rangers jersey, that Dessers chance before halftime, he tucks it away. Uh, he's uh, he's competent in front of goal uh, and he showed that on Sunday. Joshua, we'll touch on the forward line. Magic Man's donated to the channel, but we'll touch on the forward line uh, later. The defence, as Stevie says, is an absolute riot at this moment in time. Celtic could have been out of sight at half by half time at Ibrooks. Uh, the week uh, last weekend, of course, um, and uh, Rangers fortunate to go in at half time, um, just uh, the two goals down. What is going wrong here? Is it just a case of taking Connor Goldson at the firing line? I know some want James Tavernier taken out. I, I would be, uh, I would be keeping James Tavernier in my starting lineup tomorrow. Connor Goldson wouldn't be anywhere near that starting eleven. I've got to say, but um, how do Rangers fix this? And what is going wrong? Oh, how long have you got? Um, I think firstly, just to, to Stevie's point, I know you guys covered it yesterday, but the highest expected goals that Rangers have conceded in a single game um, in the last six seasons, which is just crazy. I mean, Stevie's right, uh, Ross County are second bottom. I think you need to give them a lot of credit for the way that they carried out what they were trying to do on on uh, on Sunday. And for a lot of the, the game, I thought they were the better team. And I think that is what has provoked such a, a frustrated and angry response is that you see the Motherwell game at home, Rangers probably paid the price for a slow start and you know they maybe took their eye off the ball a bit after beating Kilmarnock away that week. But they got out of jail free. But there was still the sense after that game that it still was one of those games. You know, Motherwell didn't have many opportunities. They scored with um, a, a couple of their, their, their good opportunities in the game. Rangers still should have probably won that game um, kind of in the final minutes, even if over the course they were far, they were far from their best. But I think what is the, the the worst indictment of Sunday is that they totally deserve to lose. This was an this wasn't a smash and grab game where Ross County scored off the corner, um, and and again, you know, held held things together in their box for the remainder of the game. 
the only time I think the Rangers gained territory and, and kind of controlled the game was in the final 30 minutes. And that was when Ross County actually dropped back because they had a lead to protect. They got into the opposition box uh, 25 times compared to Rangers 23. They had six shots on target to, to Rangers six. Um, and as Stevie says, they had those big chances. Uh, another fact that I think shows just how bad that performance was from Rangers, Derek, was that George Harmon gets that opportunity after, what, 50 seconds, 60 seconds in the first half. And Ross County go and score the equaliser 50 seconds, 60 seconds, or, or maybe 90, 80. That's the exact same um, model of the first half that the Clermont, even though he said he warned them in the dressing room at half time that this game is not done for whatever reason, um, the focus was not there at, the, at either start. Now, Rangers should have scored chances themselves, and we'll, we'll get on to that, um, but you can't. As you discussed yesterday, as Stevie has highlighted there, this wasn't a game that Ross Kenny were fortunate to win. I, th I think if most neutrals were watching that game, although Rangers missed opportunities, I think they'd say Ross Kenny deserved to win. Why is it going wrong? Um, I think there's a few issues. The defence was really good after the winter break. Got some stats here, Derek. They were conceding the lowest um, chance value, so expected goals conceded is just the value of opportunities that a team has conceded. The six games after the winter break, that was at 0 0.5 per 90. The six games since... Um, it's been at 1.06, so that's gone from the best in the, the division to the fourth best. So Rangers have the, the four over this six game period, so it's a small sample size. The stat that, sh that stood out to me, Derek, is that over the last six games, Rangers have conceded the most counter attacking shots on average of anyone in the league. Again, having gone from one of the best, I think it was the second or third best, 0 0.5 counter attacking shots per 90 to two counter attacking shots per 90. And, and all of Ross County's goals, the point was they were so easy to transition through. So for me, there is issues in the back four, but more generally, because the balance of the team has been impacted so much by no wingers, and Stevie's completely right to bring up Oscar Cortez, Rid Van Yilmaz is the big one for me. Rangers haven't looked the same since he has been out of that team. Um, because of the way that Clement has, I think, had to adapt, and we can get into it, adapt out wide, um, because of the way he's had to use his fullbacks, the midfield's been more open. It's no coincidence. Look at the, the, the frame of the Hibs goal that Hibs scored. It's John Lundstrom covering in at left back. There's no pressure in the midfield. You're taking a body out of midfield because Barisic is high and wide. It's the exact same for Ross County's second goal. Um, at the weekend. So Rangers' defence looks weak, yes, but the, the structure ahead of that, the way that they counter-press, keep teams penned back in, the way that they protect against transitions, that's not functioning whatsoever. And because of that, you're seeing examples like the weekend where Rangers conceded over two expected goals away from home in the league, as mentioned, for the first time uh, in, in six seasons. Uh, Stevie, Chris, Chris has got a, a piece on the website this morning on Leon Balligan and whether he should come in for... Goldson or Suter, uh, um, the goldson uh, Balligan partnership, I think, has is, is conceded less goals than the uh, the goldson Suter one. Um, Goldson's not in my team, though. I, I want to see John Suter on that right-hand side, Leon uh, on the left, and someone else other than Borna on the le uh, left back, whether that's Red Van, uh, Dujon Sterling, or Robbie Fraser, uh, whoever. Uh, I want to see a change there as well tomorrow night. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Joshua will be able to tell me better. And I look forward to, to kind of making this point and asking Joshua if it's right or not. But what seems to be happening with me is that when James Tavernier goes forward in the right, we know he can't get back. You just need to look at the third goal on, on Sunday to see how slow he was trying to get back at half pace. And he can't. But what normally happened was we were structured that one would drop in and cover and then Connor Goldson would also go across. But what happened on Sunday was, and what's been happening is that when Tavernier gets caught, there's nothing covering there at all. And that gap, on the right hand side is absolutely massive. Connor Goldson's getting exposed. But what's also happening with Connor Goldson is that he seems to be completely unsteady. He's diving into a lot of things, trying to block. You look at the one in the first half where Josh Sims gets it and he, he just a faint and a shimmy. And Connor Goldson dives and goes way past. And Butland has to make a really good save down low. And I think that Connor Goldson's completely how do I say this? He's, he's he's more or less unbalanced. He looks unstable. Every time the ball goes near him, he looks. And I think that what's happening is that's starting to spread. Jack Butland isn't coming off his line anymore as much as he once did. He's not as commanding. The left-back area is the same as the right. The, the gaps in those sides. And Ross County's three goals come down our right-hand side deck. They don't score from the right-hand side, but they come down. The first one comes across and it gets to Murray on the, at the back post. The second one is that shot that comes inside, which Butland saves out, and the boy pushes in, which nobody's following or tracking. 
And the third one is Tom Lawrence trying to track because there's nobody there and Lawrence gets pushed off the ball. It comes across. Everything is coming down those sides. And I think like you, that something has to give there. And this is what I'm talking about with Philip Clement and whether or not he's really brave enough to make those big, big decisions. Because it's all right, Derek, bringing Scott Wright in and taking him off after 45 minutes and making the really simple decisions or taking Fabio Silva after 50 minutes or Borna after 50 minutes. These are all easy decisions that we can see and we're all shouting for. Make the really big ones and the really big ones is that Conor Goldson desperately needs to come out of that team pretty quickly, not only for his own good, but for our good. And I'm with you, put Leon in on the left side and, and bring John Suter across because I think that Suter has been the, probably the more positive of the two centre-halves. But this brings me to another issue that really frustrated me the weekend. And Joshua, I'll ask you about this as well. Why, when we've got somebody as good on the ball as John Suter at centre-half, does John Lundstrom feel the need to go and sit on his toes and take the ball constantly off him? And that annoys me because John Suter's a ball playing centre half and he's good and he's got a good range of passing. Why are we sitting on top of him? And that to me is, is talking about the balance of the midfield being off as well. I spoke about it last week and said, I don't know what's wrong in there. It doesn't look right. At the weekend, Dill was so high on that left-hand side that he had no awareness of what was going on. The amount of times Danda overlapped on that right-hand side, our left-back area, and overloaded us was unbelievable. And and Dowell had no concept of what was going on behind him. And we spoke about it, Derek, last week. But it happened with a goal, the third Celtic goal. He had no idea what was going on behind him either. And it troubles me that Red Rat, that sorry, that Dowell has been out for four months and has come straight back into that team while Red Van's sitting there doing nothing on the bench. And I and I know that Red Van had a poor game against Motherwell. I get that. I granted I absolutely get that. But why after four months, is somebody coming in completely from the cold and going straight into that first team? And this is what I'm talking about with Clement. When when Wright starts, then you don't see him again. When Sterling starts and then he's benched, when he's probably our best player, when Dowell comes in completely for nothing, it feels like to me that Clement realises that there's something badly wrong here, but he's throwing stuff at the wall, trying to get it to stick to fix it, and it's not working anyway. And the, the selections that he maybe got away with earlier in the season, he's not getting away with now. So I'm just a wee bit troubled and I want to know, and we'll find out if Clement's got the, the bravery to make the really big decisions. He makes easy ones. It's all right who can Claude Cantwell after 35 minutes and trying to make an example of him. But maybe you should be looking at the so-called bigger players that consistently let us down. Uh, oh, well, well, I'll, I'll go chronologically. I mean, I, there, Josh, yeah, I, I've actually noted down the three so I don't forget them. Um, <laughs> I, I think first on the bit, I think Clement has been made big calls. I would say that, that the Cantwell one was a, a, a big call because it's sacrificing a, a player who, um, yes, it's an easy one, though, Joshua. It's an easy one. Do you think it's, do you think it's uh, here's why I don't think it's easy though? Because if you go back to that time in November, you risk losing a player by doing something like that. I think you have to manage that very well. The reason I think he did that on that day, EBS in hindsight probably should have taken Sam Lammers off, but you know, Ross McCausley came on and scored. It was against Aris, wasn't it? Came yeah. on and scored. Um, we can we can disagree if that was easier or, or, or a big call. Here's why I think he's he's changing his team so much, because where I do agree with you, Stevie, is that the the we, we've joked continually, oh, you can't really predict the Clement team, <laughs> um, and, and you can't. We've probably got two or three predicted 11s right since he came into the club. He said after the game away at um, Hibs recently, uh, I can't remember which one, if it was at the Cup or the League, he said that only five players in his team have the ability to play at the intensity he wants every five days, which was Suter, Lundstrom, uh, Tavernier, Goldson and Butland, right? And he was explaining that because, and he's not went totally into the, the fitness debate, but because of the the way that Rangers were, were prepared for the season, whatever specific that was, why they weren't totally fit for the style of play he wants to 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 introduce at Ibrox. Players cannot play that intensity every three days. So why I think he's been trying to continue continually manage that in between um, having three games a week. So take Dujon Sterling. Totally agree with you. The first thing I tweeted out when the teams came out uh, on Sunday was, why is there no Sterling? Because he was your best player in uh, it, against Celtic the week before. But certainly in that first half when no other Rangers player reached his level. The reason I think he's playing there is because we've not seen Ross McCausland come back in, which you presume is some sort of complication around the injury. So Sterling might have to play on the right wing over the next two games. That's probably the most high-intensity role within the team. 
He's just come back from, from a hamstring injury. He's going to start the next two games at left back, presuming that Ridvan Yilmaz isn't fit to start. So I think that's the, the, the reason why he's starting there. Where I agree with you, Stevie, and we wrote about this on the website yesterday, is that it's the conversation about when does the the risk of that, and maybe from his point of view, he says it's an injury risk, so that's why he's got to you know rotate Barisic in, rotate right in now and again. But when does the, the benefit of that approach um, not start to outweigh what we've what we've seen, which is that the starting eleven at Kilmarnock, I think you're right, was was wrong. The starting eleven on on Sunday, I think you're right, was wrong because now you've got what six, seven, eight games between now and the end of the season. You're not really playing three games a week all that often, um, and they are all must win games. So uh, that, that's why I think he's been rotating his team. Um, but it, it, probably what caught up with him at the weekend was that he didn't change it quickly enough. I think most people at the game would have thought you need to change something at half time, bring on more natural width on the left hand side, and um, bring Dujon Sterling on at left back. Um, the, the the second point about the, the structure, I, I agree with you in the midfield. If you look at the first goal, I think it is where Rangers get played through. Lundstrom is out on the left hand side because the, the structure is is um, is struggling to adapt to what Ross Kenty were doing with all their bodies in the centre and Dan Dunn Sims moving everywhere. And Dowell isn't he doesn't I can't remember the Ross Kenty player's name. He's the number eighteen um, who's moving into the base of midfield. And Dowell is is so slow to go and close him down. The ball goes over the top. And if you look at where Simon Murray actually is, when that ball goes over the top, um, it's indicative of the fact that Rangers really had no one control in the centre of the pitch. And everyone everyone could see that in the first half. But I think Rangers' structure, just for one reason or another, has been so impacted by not playing with wingers, which impacts the structure of their fullbacks, which means they don't have lots of players in the centre. If you look at how Rangers play, and then maybe that ties in as well to why Lundstrom is dropping in so much, Stevie. They're not really trying to play through the centre all that much away from home. They're trying to go over the top. They're trying to use the wide areas. They've not had the players to really do that since Clement came into the club. He's had to adapt. But when you had Seaman McCall's in, the, in, in there, I think you had a decent balance to the team. At the moment, there is not that balance to the team. I think Fabio Silva's had a really poor couple of games, although he, he created a couple of good opportunities in that first half um, up at Dingwall. Um, but because you're then kind of playing with square pegs and round holes in terms of him on the left of midfield instead of a left-sided forward, because you've got Barris who always needs to go high and wide instead of moving inside the pitch, and because, as you say, you're missing Ridvan Yilmaz, who has probably been before he was injured, I would say he was Rangers' most important player um, since they came back to the winter break. All those factors together, um, at some point, it was probably going to catch up with them. The team selection discussion, and, and on Sunday, that did. Had Clement moved to the bench at halftime, would it be different? Maybe the fact that he made those two substitutions right after it went 2-1 would, I think, suggest that maybe he, um, if he could have played that game again, would have made those two substitutions at halftime. Yeah, uh, lots of comments coming in. Uh, let's get to a few of them. Just on, on Sterling, uh, James says, uh, Sterling should be centre mid. Forget all this other rubbish. Uh, I, I know where you're coming from, James. I would have him in the centre of the park tomorrow as well. Uh, surely there's someone, if it's not Ridvan, that can fill in at left back. I think Dujon has to be uh, in the middle of that park. I would One of the big calls, Steve, that you said there on Goldson, and you touched on it as well, John Lundstrom doesn't deserve a starting place either. Uh, hopefully, I don't know what the situation is with uh, Mohamed Diamandi. Hopefully, we'll find out more when we hear from the manager this afternoon. Press conference, uh, the manager will hear from around about 1.45, folks. And uh, yeah, that midfield area is a, a problem uh, as well. Uh, who, who do you start tomorrow, Stevie? Um, for me, if Diamandi's fit, it's a, a Sterling Diamandi midfield with Cantwell in front of those two. Um, is Raskin coming back, perhaps? The, the honest truth is, Derek, I don't know the answer, but can I talk about John Lundstrom just for a second? There was a lot of clamour, Derek, you'll remember people saying December, January time, and even February time when, when he started to play really well, that give John Lundstrom a contract, give him it straight away. And there was people, if you remember, Derek, and you asked me quite a few times, and I said, you need to wait until the end of the season before we do anything with John Lundstrom, because we need to ensure that this becomes a normality for him instead of what becomes, wait, under Geo, etc., when he has a good couple of months and then dips way down to what he was. Chris Boyd made a point um, yesterday, rightly or wrongly, that John Lundstrom is now just running about for the sake of running about and he's not positionally doing anything and he's not impacting the game the way he should be, which I found quite interesting. As somebody like Boyd, who's played the game, is, is commenting like that. To me, John Lundstrom has went from getting a new deal to now I'm, I'm not fussed because this is what he does. And it's not only John Lundstrom, but it's others. And I'm mindful of what Joshua says. And I listen to what he's saying about structurally 
is it wrong and is he getting flung under the bus a wee bit? So I'm mindful of that as well. But it's no coincidence that John Lundstrom's played his best stuff when he's had somebody next to him in this kind of formation where Clement plays it. And even if you think about it, and I was looking at something random the other day and it was Betis away when we won 3-2 and Sifuente started in next to Lundstrom. And the both of them apparently had their, their best moments for Rangers in, in that game of the season so far. Sifuentes went off injured after 40 odd minutes and Sterling came into midfield. And again, they were they were pivotal behind our defence. And it's been suggested to me that Lundstrom needs a partner in there, which I completely get. But what he can't play with, in my opinion, is as a six. And you have somebody like Dowell and eight and then a Cantwell a 10 because it's wide open. I don't think he can control the middle the way he is. And I've watched him with Diamande, and Diamande, it's almost like he wants to be the six and play right on top of him. And I know that Joshua had a thing before saying he likes to come deep because he can turn and he can affect the game, and I read all that, and it was really good explanation. But to me, they don't look compatible either. And the midfield started to drop off in recent weeks when they two have been in there. So the question of how it affects it, Derek, is I would tighten it. I think you have to tighten it. And I think in seasons gone by where growing up and I'm watching Rangers teams, Alex McLeish, Walter Smith and stuff like that, there was times where Walter would play five centre halves and right backs and left backs at centre midfield. And he would have all sorts of defensive stuff just to go and try and win that game and make sure that we toughen up. And I spoke about it last week, about the need to tighten up and go and win a boring game 2-0. You know, if you remember, I actually said that last week. We have to get back to that. How he does it and how he fixes it. If it is a John Lundstrom problem or if it's a structural problem or if he needs to tweak where people are playing or whatever, then then do it quickly. And I'm with it, the point before Sterling has to play. He has to play in midfield because he's got the energy. We look so leggy in there. Dowell's not fast. No. Lawrence isn't fast. Lawrence coming on at the weekend was miles off it. Never, ever got into the game. He couldn't keep up with the pace that Ross County midfield were setting. And that, to me, is hugely worrying. John Lundstrom, again, covering space for the sake of covering space. So out of position, Joshua talked about covering left back. Nobody tracking runners and things like that. That's not on just him, but that's a structural thing. So how do you fix that? I honestly don't know the answer of who I would bring in. I'm looking again, thinking Raskin, because he's energetic and stuff like that. But he's not played well either, Derek. So we would just be throwing him in and hoping that he turns up as well. And I don't think this is what I go back to at the start of the conversation when I say about the core players who we all, and especially me, will be really hard on Tavernier, Goldson, Lundstrom, etc. It's because when they drop off, there's nobody else there. Yeah. Like there's nobody else in that team. Salva, Dowell, Cantwell, etc. They can't lift Rangers like those players do. So when Tavernier falls off a cliff, and I think Tavernier's form recently has been awful. On Sunday, James Tavernier, not only on the ball off it positionally, was all out of the place. His passing and things on, on Sunday was really, really bad as well. His delivery, there was a point he just kicked the ball out of the field. Stuff like that is happening to James Tavernier. But when he does that, there's nobody else. So how do you fix that team? If you listen to everything Joshua said, and I have this morning, structurally, etc., how do you fix that middle of the park? Because if they're so off, that needs to change. Do you take Lundstrom out? Do you bring in somebody else? I think as well, and something I noticed on Sunday, and I'm rightly or wrongly, see when Todd Cantwell loses the ball, he's so he plays like in a free role that means that you've effectively got somebody running off of him straight away. And then when you have Dowell that's playing slightly higher, you've got people running off of him and Lundstrom is swamped and lost. So I don't know the answer. I said this last week. How do you fix that middle? Stevie, Joshua, Stevie just on, 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 on really how you fix that. Am I making sense? Am I saying it properly? Is that happening? Because to me, it's happening. I, I just think the whole issue is, look at the, I can't remember which goal it was at the weekend. Tavernier is, has to provide width. If you look at how Rangers are playing, Barisic and Tavernier are really high and wide. Rangers fullbacks have not tended. They've done that when they've tried to build up and stretch play under Clement. They've not done that in the opposition half. For me, it's all a knock-on effect. Look at the the first Ross County goal. You've got Barisic high and wide, then you've got Lundstrom has to cover out wide. 
um, he gets turned in behind, um, as he did for that that Hibs goal, because he's defending that left back slot. You're taking the body out of the midfield. Look at the that may be in the second goal. Look at the first goal where it's Dowell in the midfield. I agree with you. The midfield selection was strange. Um, Lundstrom is again defending Dan Dow wide. But for me, the whole issue is you. Ridvan is, I, I think, one of the most, if not, uh, he, he's one of the two or three most important players in this team for Clermont because of what he can do from that left back position. There's been so many knock-on effects. You've not got a left winger, so you've got to accommodate your structure for that, both on and off the ball. You've not got a left back who's comfortable moving inside the pitch, so you've got to accommodate for that on and off the ball. What I would say to the other end, and I know we're, we'll try and get onto this, Derek, is that if Dessers takes one of his two opportunities, we're not having this discussion. Maybe we are because County have that that um, the early chance. But the, the reason I'm saying that, Derek, is because the where that look at where Dessers gets his opportunities from. He gets his opportunities from Barisic going high and wide. One of which is is I think his cutback. One of which is a silver shot that because Barisic goes in the overlap. Silver gets the space, and that's when Dessers has his excellent opportunity. So for me, yes, Ranger structure looks really bad off the ball at the moment. They're conceding a lot of counter attacks, um, et cetera, et cetera. However, how they're trying to compensate for that in, in the attack by using Barisic's strengths, by um, trying to, to use their fullback still to attack, or even Tavernier's cross that uh, Sima gets on the end of when he's playing in that kind of central position and Laidlaw makes a great save from but, but more Dessers, because they're not then capitalising on what they're creating, the issues that that, that structure and that, that um, setup is is creating for them off the ball, they're conceding from those moments. And that's why we're having the discussion. They're, they're, they're getting the negatives out of, the water they're doing, out of what they're doing, pardon me, because of what's happening up front at the moment. They're not able to capitalise on the positives and when they do create moments. But that's yeah. not new, though. They've not taken chances all season. Dessers needs one in five. We know that. And yes, he's done well. And he scored goals. I understand that completely, and I get what, what you're saying. But that's not new to how wide open we've suddenly become. But that, but that they've become wide open. I think over the last more over the last six games. Again, th- those first six games after the winter break, and I think the seventh game was the Hearts five 0 game when it was one of the best. I, I know they, they were really efficient that day, but it was a that was the last time I think they were really good in the league. They weren't wide open then. They were, when they came back right after the winter break, they weren't. They conceded two goals in the first six games. They were conceding the lowest expected goals. No, but that's that's not what I'm saying, though. I'm saying that the missed chances has been there all season, but it doesn't. that's not a factor in why suddenly in the recent games, and going back to Motherwell, I agree with you, Kilmarnock and Cortez injury, etc. there, as I said, you're right, the very start has probably hurt us more than we realised at the time. But that has suddenly become an issue of why we've become wide open. It's not a case for me that we've suddenly started missing chances. This has been throughout the season. So I don't see a coloration in, in, in both of them. It doesn't work for me. The reason I need to find out, and what I struggle is why we're so wide open. But That's I, new. That's new. Yeah, and, and the reason I think they're wide open is because normally you'd have, look at the Ross County games. I'm sorry, Derek, I'll go back to you because we're commandeering, but go, go, back no, to the Ross, no Ross, go back to the Ross County game or the Aberdeen game and look at the positions of the fullbacks. Look at what Clement said. We've got a piece uh, at the time which which sums up what Suter says and what Goldson says. And they're speaking about the reason that Rangers defence has been good is they're conceding less transitions because of their structure behind the ball when when they're attacking, right? Under Beal and, and Gerard, the fullbacks were high and wide. Clement brought them inside in line with what a lot more, more managers are doing. Rangers can't do that at the moment. The reason they can't keep their fullbacks narrow off the ball, if you look at Saturday, um, Sunday, sorry, is because they've not got players ahead of them to provide width and they've not got the profile at left back in the moment in Ridvan Yilmaz who can, who can do that. Barisic is never going to move inside the pitch. Derek and I did a video of this. It was after the Hibs game, wasn't it, Derek, where yeah. Hibs, Hibs didn't, and, and people can go and watch it on the, the stats and analysis section of the YouTube page. Hibs created a lot of transitional opportunities in the first half that day. And we kind of did a video, it was before the old firm, and we were saying, here's effectively why you should play Dujon Sterling. Because by playing him in that left-back position, he's going to interpret that differently. He's going to play narrower instead of having to go high and wide. And therefore, you're going to concede a fewer transitional opportunities. So I think it all comes down to that knock-on effect for me. Why do Rangers look so wide open? Because they've not got the profile of player really for how Clement wants to play. And we know that, I think, because of how he's played when he's had everyone available and as a result of that when they do go and attack when they do lose the ball in bad areas when they do have as you say players like Dowell and Lawrence who have an off day and are not players designed to cover a whole midfield when they do have injuries I think all that culminates into, into what you saw on Sunday 
Yeah. So the question then is, sorry, going back to what Derek asked, and we can't find the answer. How do you fix that? How do you fix that midfield? How do you how do you stop us being so wide open in the transition? I couldn't answer it. Derek asked me, and I'm uh, talking about maybe Raskin comes in because he's more energetic, but he's not playing well. So how do you fix it, Joshua? There was a comment as well saying you put Leon King as a defensive midfielder, which bring him in from uh, bring him bring in from the cold, but I wouldn't be opposed to that. They need to do something. I think the way that you, you solve it is you solve their attacking structure, right? I would put yeah. um, Mutondo in, or I'd put um, Seema off the left again. You need to play. I think there's a case that you could play Dujon Sterling first, first choice in about three or four different positions. Yeah. So, I, I, and I don't think that that Dowell and Lundstrom as a midfield you 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 you'll maybe see again yeah. domestically. Raskin is a whole other conversation, but I agree with you, Stevie. He's not been playing well, but he's someone who has legs and he has has energy. But for me, the way that Rangers will start to look better defensively, and it'll be interesting to see how many changes Clement makes to, to, uh, tomorrow is by altering what they do on the ball. Because it's a direct correlation, isn't it? When you lose the ball, the game doesn't pause and then you go, oh, let, give me five seconds and I'll get into how we defend. It's, it's it, You know, you defend as you attack, you attack as you defend. So I think the way you solve it, Stevie, I think it's difficult until you've got Yulmaz back. You need to get the right profiles of players in there. So, the, yeah, you need, you need people who can run more in the midfield. You need Red Van back as quickly as possible. You need Sterling somewhere. You need wingers in there because that will allow the fullbacks to play slightly differently and that should hopefully make them less open. But it, it all depends on having profiles. And Clement, since he came in, I don't think he's had the profile of player that if he was to build a squad, he would want just for, for the, the style of football. I think this squad was built quite specifically for a style of football last summer. And to your point, well, Cortez is such a big blow for that because he was someone who was brought in, yes, to cover Sima long term. But then also, both of those players have the ability to play on the right. That would have been your first choice, two players out wide for the duration of the remainder of the season had they been available. And it's easy to forget that Rangers' two best attackers, or, or best attacker in Sima, and I think Cortez would have been their second best attacker. And, and people know I'm a big fan of Danilo. I think he would have had a good contribution over the course of the season. They've all spent so much time out. Come on, continually had to kind of plug gaps. And um, again, I think Sunday is, 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 is that kind of catch, not the whole situation. Um, kind of catching up with Rangers having overperformed at different points to to, to get into the position they have. Yeah, uh, uh, we, we need to move on, Steve. We need to move, we need to, we need to fire on. We've got the there's people have uh, donated to the channel, which is uh, very kind of them. Just on the forward line, uh, Magic Man uh, says it. No more persevering with Dessers. Roof only has six to eight games of his Rangers career left. He's no use to us on the bench. Time to be starting him. Uh, and uh, James Strachan is also kindly donated to the channel. Thank you very much, uh, James. He says something. He says uh, on Dessers, uh, he's uh, having a go, saying he's a disgrace. He says he missed two sitters. We needed Shankland, uh, is what he's saying. Uh, I said yesterday, I think the failure to buy a proper competent number nine in the transfer window will cost Rangers the league title. Uh, Stevie, was that what you were going to come on to say, or was it something else? What they were pointing there? Should Kamar Roof start tomorrow, or do we persevere with big cereal up top? No. Um, see, before I get to that, I was going to ask Joshua if he felt that Conor Goldson needed to come out of the team because he's analytically better than, than what we are, Derek, and we're maybe more passionate and telling it from our eyes. So you've already answered. I've answered. I've always, I was interested before we moved on to see if Joshua would, and that was the only question I was going to ask. Would we would, would drop Goldson? Do you think Goldson is having a really poor time? Oh, yeah. Would you take him out, oh, yeah. you take him out of the team? I, th I, th I think Goldson is is in in the probably he's in the worst run of form I can remember uh, at Rangers. I would say um, it, it's it's pretty clear. Do you take him out of the team? I don't think Clement will. Um, would I? I don't know if I'm confident enough that Suter and Balogun would be a whole lot better. To be honest, no. I, th I think there is grounds to on his performance level, Stevie. Is there grounds to drop him? Yes. Is there enough evidence that Suter and Balogun would be a whole lot better together? I'm not sure. Um, I would be inclined to to bring Leon Balogun back in purely because I think I think something does I think we're at the point where something does does just need to change, but as as we've kind of just um, spoke for, spoke about for the last fifteen minutes, I think so much of the defensive issues is not only the back four. I think it's you know the back four looks so vulnerable. And look at again, look at that Simon Murray goal, and and if people watch back the clip, look at the midfield for all the reasons we've discussed. Look at the way that it's it pulled apart, and look at the position that Simon Murray has right in that just ahead of the defence uh, to to go and to to go and finish two times round. Yeah, the defence absolutely have uh, are culpable in that, but there's so much around that. 
that I think you need to fix as well as talking about dropping individual players. Hmm. So, but I've, so I've, I've learned a lot. Derek. Uh, What's that, Stevie? Do you want to know the answer to Kamar Roof or my opinion on Kamar Roof? Yes, please. Shouldn't be anywhere near the Rangers team. He's done. He's done. And we will cannot... A fail, will a failure to buy a proper killer in I said, the the I, said, I said it at the time in January. I posted in January. And I felt that the failure to sign a number nine, it's there on four lads, and I gave my opinion on here as well, would cost us eventually. I think Cyril Dessers has done really well under Clement. I think he had 12 and 16. I think he's probably at the now. Yeah. So his record is good, but there's absolutely no denying that he will miss opportunities when you need him to be clinical. That one where he takes a touch on Saturday and finally gets it out, and the boy does make a good save, needs to go quickly first time. The one that comes across and he and he clears the stadium with, that's what Cyril Dessers does. Now, he's a good, honest, big player, right? And I think he's done well for us at times, but He's, he's not Ranger standard. Yep. He's not what we need. Right? I'm sorry if that upsets people. He's not. Kamar Roof's time at Rangers is up. We need to let that one go. I understand what people are saying in the last six games. Maybe he can do this. He's just not capable. Kamar Roof isn't capable of putting anything substantial together. If he proves me wrong in six games and has a fairy tale ending, I would love that. But there's absolutely no evidence to support it, Derek. He's barely been available in two years now, and we suddenly expect him to come in and be the answer. He's not the answer. No. And, and he needs, along with several others, in fact, everybody else that's out of contract needs to be moved on and we need to be ruthless with that. But I understand why Cyril Dessers gets criticism. I completely understand it. But unfortunately, what other option do we truly have? And I was a bit disappointed that he came off on Sunday, I must admit, because chasing goals and stuff like that, I understand maybe the need, but Kamar Roof offered absolutely nothing when he came on and I don't think he can I think his time at Rangers is, is done I would love a fairy tale ending Derek but I'm I'm sorry I'm, I don't agree with it bringing him in at all I just don't yeah that's yeah I get, the Dacers, I get the Dacers points but yeah what do you do that's the situation we're in yeah uh CGM 55 says I did I've cancelled my 10 30 meeting all good to keep going okay well we'll keep going for a few more minutes and then we'll, we'll wrap up uh James Skeen with the point uh Joshua this is just typical uh and I'm not saying in any way shape or form bring him home but he says uh why was Lammers not tried as a striker seen he equaled a 40-year record for Utrecht on a date there six goals in his last six Eredivisie games, he's scoring goals for fun over there. I, I did predict he would have a, a good time over there, back in his own country, playing for a club with uh, uh, nowhere near the expectation levels uh, as uh, he was experiencing at Rangers. That being said, I think they're pushing for Europe for the first time in a long time at Utrecht, so they're doing uh, pretty well, but they love him over there. Hopefully he's keep, keep scoring the goals and Rangers can get a, a hefty fee for him in the summer, but I don't necessarily think uh, keeping Sam Lammers and playing him as a number nine would have been the answer, or would it, Joshua? I think if anything sums up Rangers' uh, just forward line all season, it is, it is this, that Lamb is yeah. someone who I think everyone could see in pre-season, um, and, and he's proven going over to the Eredivisie, he's a good player, he's a really good player, he just couldn't couldn't do it at Rangers, that happens, um, he was there in a difficult situation. I know he spoke about that, not having played as a number nine, that's a, there's a whole other, a whole other discussion about what Bill was maybe trying to do. The only, I think, um, what 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 you would maybe give him um, in relation to that comment is that especially under under Clement, he was probably playing a lot deeper than he than he was used to. But <laughs> when he got into certain positions, notably the first Old Firm game of the season, he didn't always perform as a striker. But I, I agree with you, Derek. I think the fact that he is doing so well will not harm Rangers who have him on a decent contract and will, I'm sure, be bumping up the price that they will um, want from him in the summer um, because, yeah, what is it, six goals in six games or six, seven? Yeah, the last six, yeah. 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 So, which is uh, quite impressive. Yeah, not to be sniffed at. Uh, there was a question that came in earlier on uh, saying, what time is the pitch inspection ahead of the game tomorrow night? If it fails, then the game will be moved to McDermott Park and fans who have tickets for that game at Dens Park, they will be valid for the game at uh, Perth. Uh, what are we thinking, lads? Stevie, think it's going to be... <laughs> think we're going to Dundee or Perth? We'll be going to Perth. There's no way that that Dundee pitch after the rainfall and expected rainfall tomorrow... Even mm -hmm. if it is playable at 12 o'clock today, 
there needs to be some decisive decisions made and I I think the fact that they've started to talk about Perth and, and plan for Perth is a clear indication to me that at 12 o'clock today we'll be told we're going to Perth, which is great. You know, it's such a good pitch as well. I remember going there for the 3-0 game and it was an absolute cow field as well, remember? Because we had to play it long in that game quite a lot and it was an awful state as well. So I'm not sure that's really going to help us too much either. But do you know what? Just get the game on because we need to get Sunday out of our system. And, you know, as people reminded me yesterday, we're still well in this. And I get that. It just feels a wee bit like the trust in this team because of things we've, we've talked about is faded and that's why everyone's still down the dumps. Yeah, uh, they've picked a, uh, the wrong time to have a, a slump, that's for sure. Let's hope they can uh, get out of it quickly uh, and they'll need to because uh, Dundee will be licking their lips. I know that they got uh, the top six place at the weekend uh, and they'll be taking the sort of debate about the state of their pitch, I'm sure, uh, to heart. And they'll be looking to put on a show wherever that game is played tomorrow. So Rangers were going to have to roll up their sleeves and be at it from the off. A, a similar performance that we've seen in Dingwall. And uh, we can say bye-bye to any league title aspirations. Right, folks, that'll do us there. Uh, big thanks to Joshua and to Stevie. Just a, a reminder again, that press conference taking place this afternoon. Uh, uh, so you'll hear um, all the reaction from that. I think Chris is at the press conference, is he, Joshua? No, me. I am there. So, uh, yeah, I'm, it's, it's early afternoon. Um, so yeah, we'll have the, the news of what's happening tomorrow. Um, so lots more content to come, people come people's way. A reminder as well, be in with a chance of winning that signed 94 95 shirt. Ah, yes. If you watch and subscribe to the website, you can subscribe one pound for just six months or 12 pounds for a year. If you enjoyed our ramblings for 46 minutes, it's the best way to support us. You can even read Stevie's thoughts every Friday or Saturday. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, well worth the subscription. You're still getting, if you stick in Clifford 10, you're still getting that 10% off. So uh, even more reason to subscribe. So uh, there you go. Huge thanks uh, to everyone for interacting with the show. A bumper episode uh, this morning, but all good uh, as ever to talk all things Rangers. We'll be back again tomorrow. We hope you can join us then as we build up to that game tomorrow night. Bye for now.